Let's worship the Lord together. Amen. Praise God. Well, all of the wrongs and all of the disappointments that Brother Booker has caused me through the years was forgiven over what he preached last night. Wasn't that tremendous? Oh, I enjoyed that. Amen. I carried my pen to this pulpit today, and I know it's too late to make any more notes. But I brought it up here for a reason. Brother Hyler was just preaching and saying, you know, this is me. I take responsibility for what I'm saying, so forth and so on. I just wanted to bring this pen up here to symbolize how I feel about it. I am ready to endorse and sign on to what he preached. <laughs> I believe every word of it. Amen. Praise God. I just, I just preached at home last week or last Sunday night. Uh, let the church say amen. And uh, I saw from the word of the Lord how that God is the one that instituted us saying amen. And it started when the commandments were being read and the people were to say amen, which meant even so, but it went beyond that. It also meant I'm signing on. I endorse that. I'm in favor of it. Amen. I vote for that. I accept that. Amen. So I want to say amen to uh, what's been preached here in this conference. And uh, I realize you go to conferences and, and uh, a lot of diverse men from different areas are preaching. And uh, we all have our own battles and our own things that we're dealing with. And sometimes people say things at a conference like this. I don't necessarily agree or disagree. I'm not sure where I stand on it. I just have to give it some thought and, uh, and decide later. And on some occasions, I've heard some things said that I knew without thinking on it, I don't agree with that. That's just not right. They have a right to say it, and I've got a right to not agree with it. But at this particular meeting, uh, everything that's been said up to now, I endorse, I sign on, I agree with it, I believe it, I appreciate it. I have been so blessed by being here, uh, much, much more than I feel that I could even be a blessing or have adequate words to express. Without taking a whole lot of time, I'm aware that uh, you've been here for a long time, and uh, I want to uh, take that into consideration. Plus, the less time I spend in preliminaries, the more time I have to preach. But uh, I want to thank Brother Morton and the others involved in this meeting for their invitation and their wonderful, wonderful hospitality and the accommodations and all the kind things that have been said and done. And uh, I appreciate that very, very much. And perhaps I'll get a chance to say a little bit more about that later. But for now, would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 7? Very happy to have my wife with me. We've been down a lot of roads together, and uh, hopefully we'll travel down a few more together in the will of God. Amen. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Romans 7, verse number 7. If you found it, say praise the Lord. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. 
Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was in that which is good made death unto me, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Hebrews 12 and 1, very familiar verse of Scripture. Brother Hyler used it some in his message this morning. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We're familiar with this passage of Scripture. I'm sure we've heard many messages about laying aside weights and sins, which does easily beset us. And uh, I want to look especially at this area here of sin, which does so easily beset us, which suggests that it is a recurring thing. It is something that we struggle with. It's particular sins that have a strong pull on us individually, things that we stumble over, things that we struggle with. And we oftentimes refer to these as besetting sins, things that we seem to have inclinations and inherent weaknesses toward. And uh, we know that these things are hindering our walk with God and have the potential of destroying our walk with God. And I'm sure that all of us have some areas that we struggle with. And we all want to be overcomers and to be more like Jesus. Isn't that right? Above all else, I must be saved. That's my goal. That's my desire. That's what I'm striving for. And uh, so I've given a lot of thought to besetting sins and feel the Lord has dealt with me and given me a little insight on some things, and I trust that I can transmit that from my heart to your heart today. But with the Lord's help, I want to preach on this subject, when sin becomes exceeding sinful. When sin becomes exceeding sinful. Let's pray together right now. Lord God, we thank you for your word that's gone forth in this assembly hall over the last two days. We thank you for your anointing. We thank you, Lord, for truth that has been proclaimed. For the way that you've spoken our hearts and touched our spirits. God, I'm asking you to come one more time and anoint me and give me grace and give me strength that I might obey you and deliver the message that you've given. Open hearts to be receptive today, God, for I want your word to accomplish that purpose for which it's sent out. Let your will be done in every life, in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Gathered here this afternoon, we have a common problem. It's a universal problem. Our problem is not an environmental problem. It's not a social problem. But it's a genetic problem. Amen. It's something that resides in your spiritual DNA and was passed down to us from our very first parents, Adam and Eve. find it rather interesting. I came across an article some time ago, and the scientific world has now, uh, in their genetic uh, research, has came to this conclusion, has proven conclusively that all of us go back to a common ancestor And uh, this particular tracer's DNA, uh, genetic tracers that they're looking at is passed down through the mother. And so they have dubbed whoever that first ancestor is. The scientific community calls her Eve. What an original thought. Amen. Aren't you glad when science finally catches up to where the rest of us already are? (laughs) Amen. But uh, there's some things that's been passed down to us besides uh, our looks and other functions in our bodies. 
and uh, there's some things that have been passed along spiritually as well. And the problem that we all are struggling with, and we will deal with this until God calls us home, is this problem called sin. Amen. Our problem is a sin problem. Now, I realize before I get started that this particular message probably will not have you on your feet rallying and hollering and encouraging me to preach this because it's going to get way too close to home and much too uncomfortable for all of us to be able to respond in that manner. That's not what I'm really after today. I want, by the help of the Lord, to help all of us to more clearly understand how God feels about sin and how to access the remedy that God has provided for us to be uh, victorious and live a life above sin. Amen. And that's what we're all striving for. But God's Word clearly shows us that sin is the root cause of all of our spiritual, all of our emotional, and even many of our uh, physical problems can be traced back to this problem uh, that we identify as sin. The type of sin that I want to look at in particular is not necessarily those chance things that come our way. But I want to deal with those areas that the devil knows how to use against us so very, very well. Amen. Those uh, uh, besetting sins that I mentioned in our scripture text this morning. And uh, one person called it the well circumstance sin. Uh, that sin which has seemingly everything in its favor. It's time and place and opportunity. Uh, the object of the sin and the heart of the man is inclined and drawn one to the other. It's one of those sins in which all these things come together and frequently occur. And consequently, this particular tri type of transgression is frequently committed. That's the kind of sin I'm talking about. I'm talking about the sin of our own constitution or disposition. Uh, the sin of our own trade, that in which our worldly honor or our secular profit or our sensual gratification are most frequently felt and consulted. Amen. One, uh, it goes on to say it's a sin that meets us at every turn, always presenting itself to us, or it's the sin that we are addicted to. David, in dealing with this sin problem, in Psalm 51 and 5, he said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Amen. And the only remedy prescribed by God for sin is repentance. That sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Amen. Isn't it great that God has made the eradication of sin in our lives so easy? All you have to do is repent, and your sins can be taken care of. But you see, there's something about the way that we are put together emotionally and, and mentally that makes it difficult sometimes for us to repent. One of the greatest obstacles to repentance is to get people to acknowledge that they have sinned. The acknowledgement of sin is a necessary step to repentance. I realize repentance is not popular in the day and hour that we're living in. Amen. People are teaching that you can get the Holy Ghost without repenting or just recite some little prayer that reminds me an awful lot of what we call the sinner's prayer that we used to uh, have a lot of negative things to say about. Uh, but now we're using it even in so-called apostolic ranks. We're all going to say a little sinner's prayer of repentance together and all of us are going to receive the Holy Ghost it's no wonder people have so many struggles I'm telling you our victory in living for God is in direct proportion to the depth and sincerity of our repentance and real repentance demands and requires more than God forgive me because I realize that I'm a sinner and I have fallen short Real life-changing repentance is when you deal with sin face to face. Amen. You take it on. You acknowledge it. You confront it. And you confess your sins. 
Amen. There's been a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion. I'm sure we could get a lot going here today about what is the unpardonable sin. I know it's in the Bible. I know the Bible talks about it. I have my opinions. Uh, But I know one sin for sure that is unpardonable. Amen. The unpardonable sin, the only sin that God cannot forgive, would be the one that we refuse to acknowledge and ask him to forgive us for. Amen. So, you know, why is it so difficult to repent? Well, it seems easier to make excuses than to acknowledge that I have come short. I have failed. I have sinned. Amen. The writer of the book of Proverbs in Proverbs 28 and verse 13 said, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. The solution is so simple. Amen. It's so thorough. It is so effective. Amen. But we must acknowledge and confess our sins and forsake them in order to receive God's abundant mercy. How many of you want God's mercy today? I don't think I'm doing too much violence to this scripture by saying he that excuseth his sins shall not prosper. Amen. This is the same route, the same road that was paid for us by Adam and Eve. Amen. They had an opportunity to acknowledge their sins. I've often wondered what if or what could have been or what would have happened had certain things uh, transpired just a little bit differently. For instance, when Adam and Eve realized that they uh, were naked and they sought to cover themselves, I call this the original camouflage suit. Amen. They're the ones that invented it, not a hunter. Amen. But a hider uh, uh, invented camouflage. And I'm just wondering when they heard the voice of the Lord calling them, that was God dealing with them. That was God talking to them. This was an opportunity, as I understand the way God works, for them to repent. This was an opportunity to step forward. This was an opportunity uh, to go looking for God and say, God, I have a problem. I need some help. And God could have then... Uh, given them some measure of mercy. But no, they hid from God. And when God sought them out, when God found them, and he said, what's going on here? What have you done? What was the first thing that Adam did? He didn't say, Lord, I've sinned. I'm sorry. I broke the commandment that you gave us and told us not to do. But he began to make an excuse. And in making his excuse, it became very presumptive because he actually accused God and said, it's your fault. The woman thou gavest me, she ate and gave to me, and I ate also. If you hadn't put this woman in my life, I wouldn't be in the problem I'm in. We've been using that one ever since, haven't we? Amen. We've, men have perfected that. I tell the young men in my church, you need to get married. Y'all are making such a mess out of your life, you need a wife to blame it on. Amen. We've got to keep this tradition alive. But what is so bad about sin? Why am I so concerned about sin this afternoon that I would take uh, advantage of your time and this opportunity to talk to you about sin? The thing about sin that is so terrible is it first of all destroys our relationship with God. Amen. Now that's very important to me today. Amen. To have a relationship with God. And even above and beyond destroying that relationship is sin will prevent us from being saved. Amen. The old song says sin shall never enter there. In fact, the judgment bar, simple spot your soul shall mar. It shall never, sin shall never enter there. Amen. And so much of the problems and the struggles that our people are having, and I want to address a lot of the things that I say this afternoon, especially and particularly to our young people, but much of the problems that our youth are struggling with today, it's because of sin and its effect upon their lives. Amen. If we can go to the root of the problem and deal with it there, then a lot of the symptoms will vanish. And somebody say, praise the Lord. We're living in a a generation that is uh, uh, filled with immorality. Amen. Uh, Our society is saturated with rock music. Uh, There were some men that came out to work at uh, my son's house the other day, and I heard this raucous sound, and I went up there to see what it was. And uh, these contractors had drug out their boom boxes and was playing this loud rock music. I expected to see young people 
But much to my surprise, uh, several of them were as old as I am. And so now this rocking generation is three generations along. And it's increasingly getting more and more vile and having more and more of a detrimental effect upon the youth of America. Amen. I think about this sports crazed world that we live in. This entertainment uh, 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 people that have to have entertainment all the time. This bored generation. Amen. I'm bored. Somebody entertain me. Somebody put on a show. Somebody take me somewhere. Buy me something. Give me some money. Give me something to do. I am Bored. Amen. It's a sensual uh, generation. It's an immodest generation. Amen. And so our, uh, we have to fight and cope with these things. I'm not standing here to condemn our Pentecostal young people. My heart goes out to them. Amen. I remember some of the struggles I had as a Pentecostal young person. Just a few days ago, I had a, 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 I had a, a very in-depth discussion, a very pointed discussion with a minister that came into the church when he was about uh, in his late 30s or 40 years of age, and he's pastoring now, and, uh, and uh, he doesn't uh, understand what our Pentecostal young people are going through. And he feels like because when he came to church, all he wanted uh, was to be in church and a prayer meeting, that that's all that people need to, uh, uh, in this day and time, young people to live for God. And I was trying to help him understand, you do not uh, uh, know the pressure that is brought to bear upon our apostolic young people. They've got energy. They want to go places. They want to do things. Uh, and they're looking for something to do. And I, my philosophy is, if you don't find them something to do, they're going to find something to do on their own. It's a whole lot better, amen, to know what they're doing and where they're doing it and who they're with and, and to have uh, adequate supervision than for them to be out here on Friday night and Saturday night finding their own entertainment. And so I know the pressures. And many of our kids go to public schools and are exposed to attitudes in their neighborhood and, and maybe jobs that they work and different things. And, and so much pressure is brought to bear upon them. And, and so they are being uh, brainwashed and uh, all kinds of subtle influence is being brought to bear upon them. And so uh, as Brother Booker uh, so uh, uh, very well spoke against television, the evils of Hollywood last night. And uh, Brother uh, Heiler uh, dealt with some issues a little bit earlier. And if I could throw anything in, I'd like to weigh in and say we also need to be very careful about these video games. Brother Morton was just talking about being tuned in to our new converts. We found out some time ago uh, that some of these uh, video games that seem quite harmless, but some kind of cheat code the kids got a hold of, and they could put certain codes in there, and all the women uh, uh, in that game was nude. And, of course, some of our Pentecostal young people had to try that out. But isn't it a shame that our young people uh, have to be exposed to so much ungodliness and so much pressure and so much temptation? Amen. The rules and the supervision that uh, took care of problems in the 60s will not work in 2005. The devil has become so much more sophisticated. And the world has turned out so many more opportunities to sin. If there ever was a day and time when we need to pray for our young people. And we need to watch them closely. And we need to be involved in them. It's in the day and hour that we're living in. Amen. The world is going all out for our youth. Amen. It's uh, holding no stops. It's not holding anything back but it's coming after them every way that it can. But my Bible tells me that when the enemy would come in as a flood, the Spirit of the Lord is going to raise up a standard against it. And one of the ways the Spirit of God raises up a standard is through directing, anointed, apostolic preaching. I believe God will move upon our pastors and upon our evangelists and upon God-called men, amen, to preach to us the things that we need to know in order to avoid the pitfalls of sin in this generation. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. But 
But you see, the constant exposure to sin and by the heat being turned up gradually, we become accustomed to things that, if you would think back with me a few years ago, uh, would have uh, been abhorrent to us. And now we don't even think anything of it. When I first started coming to this meeting here on the West Coast, if somebody would have got up, and I'm not saying this to be crude, I'm saying this to illustrate something. If somebody, I don't care how carefully they had couched the terminology, but if they had talked about the kind of activity that our former president was involved in, everybody would have went, I can't believe he said that. But I hear children talking about it. We have become desensitized to sin. And consequently, there are many things that are exceeding sinful, but we do not have that kind of a perspective or a concept concerning that. To us, it's just one of those things. Everybody's doing it. It doesn't seem to be all that big of a deal. And if I were the devil, I would certainly work to convince people that their sin wasn't really all that bad. We're living in a society that minimizes and excuses sin. Amen. They call it a social evil. Or they say that it's a result of your upbringing. Or you've made a mistake or perhaps a misjudgment. But how long has it been since you heard somebody stand and say, Please forgive me for I have sinned. Hallelujah. And even if somebody sins on a grand scale and it calls for public confession in our local churches, they don't usually get up and say, I have sinned against God. They get up and say, I have made a dreadful mistake. Yes, you've made a mistake, but it's more than a mistake. You have sin. Why don't we call sin what God calls it? So we come up with all kinds of of remedies and and all kinds of of diagnosis. But if you don't call it what it is, you're going to misdiagnose it. And if the diagnosis is wrong, the prescribed treatment or remedy will be wrong or ineffective. When we seek to minimize or to glamorize or to ignore or to make excuses for sin, we remove the incentive for people to repent. I feel uncomfortable dealing with people when they have sinned. And I'm sure every pastor does. And it'd be real, real easy at such a time as that to kind of back off and say, well, I understand you meant well and you've done wrong and God loves you and God will forgive you. And I know we have to give people hope. But please understand what I'm saying here today. If we're not careful, we're going to minimize it and we're going to uh, 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 make excuses for it until people leave out uh, feeling uh, uh, that, you know, it really wasn't all that bad. I didn't do as bad as I thought I did. Amen. We need people, amen, to feel a need to repent because that's the only way they can get right with God. You can't get sin right by ignoring it. If you have some kind of terrible bacterial infection in your body, it doesn't go away just by ignoring it or hoping that it will go away. It has to be addressed. Oh, I'm starting to feel the Holy Ghost. I felt a lot of resistance when I got started. But I feel the anointing of God coming to help me preach this message and help somebody here this afternoon. Amen. You know why we have problems thoroughly repenting? It's because the thing we're trying to repent of seems so innocuous or or cute or harmless. But when we see sin in its raw, ugly state, when we see it from God's perspective, when we see its potential for destruction in our lives and in the lives of others, then it doesn't seem so harmless. And then it seems very abhorrent. It's something that we do not want to be connected with or associated with. I'm preaching to you this afternoon what we need in 2005 in the apostolic movement is a fresh revelation of God's holiness and our sinfulness. We need to see our sins, but we need a revelation of God's holiness. And then perhaps something can happen to us 
akin to what happened to Isaiah in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. I would like for the Holy Ghost to move in here this afternoon and give us a revelation of the exceeding sinfulness of sin and give us a revelation of God's divine holiness that when we see the contrast and when we see the conflict and when we see how far that we have come from being what God wants us to be that we would be uh, so ashamed and so disgusted with our sin that we would put it so far from us that we would never return to it again. Praise God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 6, I'm not going to take the time to read it. I'm hurrying along here. But you can read the first five verses. But this is where uh, Isaiah received the vision of the Lord in the year the king Uzziah died. He saw the Lord in his temple. He saw him up on his throne, high and lifted up. And he saw the seraphims, the, the angels with the six wings that flew back and forth, uh, guarding the holiness of God. Amen. Looking out that nothing unclean or defiled would enter into his presence. And they were flying and crying one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory in the post the door moved at the voice of him that spoke then Isaiah is seeing all of this and uh, he had seen uh, the king Uzziah's throne, he'd been in his throne room many times they were personal friends, he was a consultant or advisor to the king and no doubt was impressed by Uzziah but when he saw God's throne and God in his glory he was very very much impressed. He'd never felt this way before coming before the throne of of a human king but he felt so moved by what he saw that he cried out and said, woe is me or I am in bad trouble. I've got serious problems. I'm in a mess. I'm not doing near as good as I thought I was. I'm not as holy as I thought I was. I do not feel worthy to be doing what I'm doing or be where I am. He said, for I am undone. I'm incomplete. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why do you feel that way, Isaiah? He said, because mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. I would like to point us to the king today, to the Lord of hosts, the Holy One of Israel. We need a revelation of holiness. It's more than standards, but it's trying to live and think and be what God was. Did not Apostle Peter say, Be ye therefore holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. God wants us to replicate in us his likeness, amen, his spirit, his attitude, his actions, and we are so far from that, and we should never quit pursuing it. I'm not preaching sinless perfection here today, but I am telling you that you can walk out of here this afternoon, amen, with the chains of the besetting sin broken in your life, and you never have to go back to it again. Amen. You don't have to live in condemnation because he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. God has exactly what you need this afternoon to live an overcoming victorious life. He doesn't want you to always be living in condemnation. Amen. Dragging around with your lip dragging a a furrow in the ground. Amen. But God wants to fill you so completely with his spirit and remove everything from you that's not pleasing unto him that you can uh, experience that joy unspeakable and full of glory that Apostle Peter spoke about. Oh, hallelujah. You can be seated. You see, it was when and only when that Isaiah saw the Lord in his holiness that he could really see himself in the right perspective. He's got not his peers, not his friends, not his mom and dad, whoever. That's not who he's looking at now. But he's looking at the Lord in his holiness. And when he saw the Lord in his holiness, then he saw himself in his sinful, iniquitous state and saw his need of repentance and purging. I'm here to submit to us today that we're without excuse. We know what the law of God is. 
We know what his expectations are. He's given to us his written law. Amen. He's given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. We know what is acceptable and pleasing in God's sight. It's at meetings such as this that everything is brought back into focus. Amen. The picture is so clear. Amen. After that preaching yesterday and the first night and then this morning. Amen. We know, we know what it takes to live a life that is acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God. It's not a lack of knowledge of most of you that are sitting before me today. Most of you sit under godly men that fear the Lord, that love God, that love holiness, that teach to you, amen, the right way to walk. And so it's not a matter of not knowing or ignorance. We do know. But what is our problem then? Amen. We are struggling with our flesh. Amen. We have besetting sins. Our unique personalities have inclinations and is drawn and enticed towards certain types of sins or vices or activities. Amen. Am I with, are you with me? Amen. You understanding what I'm preaching? Amen. So in our scripture text, there's several things that are mentioned here. And it starts out in the way of a question, which oftentimes Paul did, especially in the book of Romans. And he said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? No, God forbid. It's not sin. He said, the only way that I understand what sin is, I had not known sin except by the law. The law is what clarified and defined for me what sin is. And then it's kind of like an IE for he said, for I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. He said, I wouldn't even realize that covetousness was a sin except the law pointed it out for me. The law said, thou shalt not covet. Now I know that it is a sin to be covetous. And then he goes on talking about the law, the commandment ordained to life. But unto me it was death because it brought condemnation. He said, sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and used it to slay me. He said, but remember this, the law is holy. The commandment is holy and just and good. Was that then which is good made death unto me? God forbid. Now get this. He said, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. The law of God is what brings sin into proper perspective. It's the law of God that brings it into clear focus. There may be things that intuitively we know is probably not exactly right. This is why Brother Hyler, amen, was sitting at the kitchen table and asking his mom, do you think I ought to be playing little league ball? But how much more that could have been reinforced if he had gone to Wednesday night Bible study and the pastor would have said, amen, uh, we do not believe in pursuing worldly sports. And would have gone into the word of the Lord and brought out some pertinent scripture to teach, amen, that we separate ourselves from such activity as competitive sports. Then that would have been the law showing to him that uh, by the commandment, this is not just something uh, that I might not ought to be doing, but I absolutely don't want to do this. Amen. I'm not going to uh, even get close to being involved in, in, in this type of a situation. And then Paul concludes by saying, we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal soul under sin. If you'll bear with me, I want to, I want to give you just a few quotes from uh, some different uh, commentators that have, have uh, different comments that they've made about this passage of Scripture. Uh, Matthew Henry commentary, it says, uh, it was discovering. It was discovering. I had not known sin, but by the law. He said, as that which is straight discovers that which is crooked. As the looking glass shows us our natural face with all of its spots and deformity. So there is no way of coming to that knowledge of sin which is necessary to repentance and consequently to peace and pardon, but by comparing our hearts and lives with the law. As that which is crooked is discovered or revealed by that which is straight. 
Even so does the law of God, amen, show us, amen, the perverseness in our own hearts and minds and lives. Barnes notes, he said that it might appear sin, that it might develop its true nature and be uh, no longer be dormant in the mind. The law of God is often applied to a man's conscience that he may see how deep and desperate is his depravity. Listen to this. No man knows his own heart until the law thus crosses his path and shows him what he is. You don't even really know what you are about, who you really are, until the word of God is preached and comes right down the street where you live and crosses your path and shows you what you are. Amen. Another commentator said, but sin became death unto me to the end that it might appear sin. He said, this is a rare and pregnant expression, meaning that it might be seen. I'm talking about sin, that sin might be seen in its true light in all its naked deformity. And then again, thus it appears that man cannot have a true notion of sin, but by means of the law of God. There was a twofold purpose for the law. One, design of the law was to show the abominable and destructive nature of sin. The second reason is it was to be a rule of life. And so consequently, it's almost impossible for a man to have that just notion of the demerit of sin so as to produce repentance if the law were not applied to his conscience by the Spirit of God. It's then and then alone that you see yourself to be carnal and sinful and in need of repentance. Hebrews 4 and 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's only when we are confronted with the law of God that sin is revealed in its true nature. I want to digress just for a moment here. Amen. I think that I'm reaching the age that maybe I can say a few things that might help some younger preachers. Amen. And we're living day and time when, when uh, you know, you're supposed to be kind and sweet and nice and, and you're not supposed to confront anybody and, and you're trying to do your best to preach and teach everything in such a way that everybody will like you and think you're a nice guy when you get through. But that kind of preaching will not produce the kind of repentance that people need to make. Amen. God sent Ezekiel to a rebellious people. And we are living in a rebellious age. And he said there's only one way to deal with what you're going to come up against, Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse number 2 through 4, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm quoting from the NIV translation. Have you come to inquire of me? As surely as I live, I will not let you inquire of me, declares the sovereign Lord. Will you judge them? Will you judge them, son of man? That's what a preacher's job is, is to discern and judge between the holy and the unholy, between the clean and the unclean. Amen. And then he went on to say, then confront them with the detestable practices of their fathers. True preaching will confront the sin in your life. Somebody said you need to make people feel good about themselves when they come to church. Not always. I don't think you ought to always be beating people down. I think this thing has to be balanced out. I believe in preaching faith. I enjoyed that faith preaching the other night. In fact, I'll probably preach on faith more than any other subject in the Bible. But it takes more than faith to please God. It's impossible to please God without faith. Amen. But you also got to live right to please God. That's right. The Bible teaches that just as strongly as it takes faith to please God. And so there are times when we need to hear confrontational preaching. There's some things going on around here that God's not pleased with. I appreciate that confrontational preaching we heard just a little bit ago. There's some things I'm bothered about. There's some things that worries and troubles me. There's some things that are not apostolic, Elder Hyler said. 
Thank you, Brother Hyler. Amen. I say amen to those same things. There's nothing wrong with confronting sin and the things that lead to sin. In fact, it's a whole lot better to deal with the spirit of it when it first starts coming in than it is to let it get full blown and try to get it out. Amen. So God's remedy for dealing with sin, especially when you're dealing with the rebellious and iniquitous generation, he said what you need to do is to confront them with the detestable practices of their fathers. And I submit to you today that it's only when sin is identified for what it really is and confronted that there's any hope of resolution. Suggestions just don't cut it in 2005. You just have to throw back your ears and open your mouth and get red in the face and scream and holler and beat on the pulpit and say this is displeasing to God and this church was not going to stand for it and if you don't repent, we don't have a place for you around here. You'll be understood when you put it that plain. Now, God knows how to deal with this. And God allows some things to come into our lives sometimes, adversity. And the purpose of that adversity is to get our attention. You know, sin has consequences. Wages of sin is death. We know you reap what you sow. Sin has consequences. Isn't that right? But sometimes we look at the consequences of sin as being punitive, of God is, is punishing us. God is trying to get even with us. That's not really the purpose of chastisement and even a lot of the consequences of sin that comes to us. Amen. Many times uh, this adversity that comes to us, we brought it upon ourselves. Amen. You don't need a rebuke in the devil when you're the one that planted the, har- the crop that you're harvesting. Rebuke yourself because you're the devil that did it. Amen. But God told Israel that he would send adversity to them. And it would be because of their sins. But as they were suffering adversity, he would send them teachers that would show them the right way to walk. And if they would listen to them, they would find repentance and the blessings of God would follow their obedience Let me show you here in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse number 20 and 22. And Isaiah said, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. Oh, this is good. He's saying adversity has come. Trouble has come. You're in trouble. But he said, even while you're in trouble, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I want you to be saved. I want to help you. I want to do everything I can to help you. He said, I'm going to give you a teacher, not off in the corner somewhere, but I'm going to put him out front. Amen. Front and center. That is going to teach you the right way to go. And then coupled with that, he said, my spirit is going to be working with the word. The word and the spirit agree. And your ears is going to hear a word from behind you saying, this is the way. Walk you in it. Even in this conference. Listen to me right now. I feel this in the Holy Ghost so strongly. Many of you came here and have received instruction and directives from God. Amen. There are people, amen, that may not have the background of holiness and separation uh, uh, that uh, Brother Morton and some of the others that helped sponsor and come to this kind of meeting and so forth, and you haven't been exposed to that. But you came with a hungry heart. You came wanting direction from God. And that direction has come to you across this pulpit so direct so clear such a distinct sound and at the same time the spirit of the Lord has spoken to you confirming and saying this is the way walk you in it when you turn to the right hand or the left it's there to guide you and say no don't go right let's stay right here this direction you need to turn to the left a little bit right here the spirit of God leading and guiding us into all truth How many of you believe that God is able in this age that we're living in of compromise and apostasy? Amen. Uh, He knows how to find and lead hungry hearts. I 
I'm looking for a revelation of separation to sweep across, amen, the Pentecostal movement. I'm talking about people who have been truly born again in the water and of the spirit. I believe that it's getting so bad, people are getting fed up with it, and there's some that's saying there's got to be something better than this, and they're looking and searching for the old past, amen, and God's going to bring teachers into their lives that's going to show them clearly this is the way, and the spirit of God's going to say, walk ye in it. When is that going to happen? When are we going to get that kind of directing, directive from God? It's when we truly repent. For true repentance awakens the conscience to the place that you can hear the voice of God when he speaks to you in a still, quiet voice. When he wants to lead you in paths of righteousness, you're going to hear him. But he said you're going to hear a word behind you. This is the way he walked you in. And verse 22 picks up and says, now listen to this. You shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a minstrel's cloth. Thou shalt say unto him, get thee hence. Here's what happens. When God gives you a revelation of your sin and you see it for what it really is in its raw state, it's so reprehensible. It's so vile that you want to violently cast it away from you. It's not something you're pining after or crying after. It's not like those britches that Brother uh, Booker preached about that the woman hung in the closet against the day that she backslides so, you know, she don't even have to bother to go to town and buy another pair of britches. She can just slip them on and start sending it up. No, no. When you get a revelation... When you get a revelation, it's going to become so vile to you. And the, the, the language that's employed here, it's just, it's just like filth of the human body. You just ugh, get it away from me. And that's how your sin becomes when you get a real revelation of sin. And what God said is, you see, their, their uh, uh, besetting sin was idolatry. Amen. Even as it was pointed out, uh, Balaam is the one that introduced that to him. And, and from that time on until after the Babylon captivity for a period of hundreds of years, they had a very extreme problem with idolatry. One uh, judge would bring them away from it for a few years and go right back to it. Different kings would arise. Some of them would lead them away from idolatry and others would uh, bring them back to it and institute more idolatry. But it was a severe problem. It was a recurring problem over and over and over again. Uh, they had an affinity for idols. There was something about idols that kept attracting uh, these people. I think it must have perhaps had something to do with identity because uh, they were serving a, a, an invisible God. Their God was a spirit, and no man had seen his face at any time. But the nations around them, they had these big fancy temples and idols of gold and silver and stone and wood and other things, and, and uh, they had identity, and they had little replicas that they carried around with them. And, and when they went to war, they took their gods with them and I, I, it seems like there must have been some kind of insecurity or, or, or some kind of an identity uh, problem with Israel and so they kept wanting to find something that they could use as a national symbol and, and as an identification mark, something they could rally around and say, hey, we're not behind anyone else. Look at our idol. Look at our golden calf. Look at our Ashtaroth. Look at what we've got. So they kept being drawn back to idolatry again and again and again. But God said the day was coming when he was going to deal with them with the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. And when that was passed, he said, then you will see your idols the same way that I see it. Amen. You will defile the covering of those images. You're going to cast it away from you as filth, and you will never return to it again. In fact, he went on to say, it's going to be so bad that you won't even want to use the gold or silver from these idols. Because everybody knows you can refine gold and silver. It could be uh, remelted and, and purified and recast into another image. It's valuable. It could be used for something else. But he said, when you see these idols as abomination that I see, you're going to hate it so strongly that you won't even want the gold or the silver that comes off of these idols. You're going to cast it from you as something vile. 
Now listen to this. I'm getting close to the end, but don't miss this. In Deuteronomy 7 and 25, the Lord had given them instruction and commandments of what they were to do with graven images and idols. He said, the graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. God said after it has been, uh, I guess, consecrated to idol deities, it's an abomination to me. You can take it and recast it and rework it and do whatever you want to with it, but it's still an abomination to me. I don't want it, and I don't want it near you unless it corrupts you. So he said, what I want you to do when you capture one of those idols I don't want you to save anything from it. You burn it with fire. You utterly destroy it. You get rid of it. It's an abomination to the Lord thy God. So they knew what to do with it. They had the commandment. They knew what the law said. But it did not happen until they got a revelation of sin for themselves to actually desire to cast it away. Do you know that history records that after they return from Babylon captivity, that remnant that faithful remnant, and were reestablished in the land that they were as zealous for monotheism as they had ever been for idolatry formerly. One commentator said how foolishly mad they had formerly been upon their idols in the days of their apostasies. But now it's said idolaters are said to be mad upon their idols, dotingly fond of them. But now it's said of Israel how wisely mad they now were at their idols. What a holy indignation they conceived against them in the days of their repentance. Listen at this. They not only degraded their images but defaced them. Not only defaced them but defiled them. They not only spoiled the shape of them but in a pious fury they threw away the gold and the silver they were made of. Though otherwise valuable and Convertible to good use that could not find in their hearts to make any vessels of honor of them. And that's the way sin becomes to all that are truly repentant. It, it, it stinks. It's a stench. It's odious. They loathe it. They loathe it because of what it's done to them. They hate it because of its ability to ensnare and enslave them. And they cast it away to the dunghill. They want nothing to do with it. And even to this day, the Jewish people abhor idolatry, abhor it. They don't want anything to do with it. How did that happen? God brought pressure on them, and they got a revelation. And even so, today, those of us that would join ourselves to the Lord and call ourselves Christian, we must abandon every sin and say unto it, get as far from me as you can. But it's difficult to repent when you love yourself and you love your sin more than you love God. It's only when you get a true revelation of sin and your sinfulness that you can truly repent. It used to be popular to preach repentance. But there's a lot of people sitting here in the sound of my voice today that have you have never in your life heard anybody preach against sin the way that I am right now about repentance, emphasize repentance. I'm not talking about people that come from Brother Morton's church and other churches, but I'm telling you, there are people here, I feel it in the Holy Ghost. You're blown away by it. You don't even know what to think. But I'm telling you, this is part of the apostolic tradition. This is biblical. Before the Holy Ghost was given, a man whose ministry was dedicated only to repentance came to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus. And before we had the revival that all of us are hungry for, there will first be a revival of repentance. Yes, there will. Amen. Repentance prepares the way of the Lord. Repentance makes the crooked way straight. Repentance takes care of low ways and low living. Are you listening to me? Amen. Repentance brings the high places of pride down. Repentance fills up the low places of deceit. Are you listening to me? It prepares our hearts 
for a move of the Holy Ghost. In fact, I submit to you this afternoon, if we will spend a little time in prayer and really repent this afternoon, amen, it will prepare the way for a tremendous Holy Ghost outpouring even tonight. Amen. You will receive some things from God that you've been hungry for for a long, long time if you will really, really repent of your sins today. I don't have anything I need to repent of. I'm doing fine. Amen. I'm all right. Well, let's look at it. Everybody stand. Let me read to you what happened to a man that was confronted with his sin. A prophet came in had an audience with him and talked to him for a little bit. Gave him a parable. A parable that appealed to this man's heart for he was a shepherd and he talked about sheep. And then this parable, the villain, was a very, very wealthy man that took the one little pet sheep from a poor man and his children. It was a pet in their house. They held him in their arms. They loved on it. They combed its wool, they washed it, they hand fed it. They were so attached to this pet. And the rich man with the power came and took that from them and slew it and prepared it and fed it to his guest. And David was so angry, he said, I can't believe that. Whoever did that is going to repay fourfold. They're going to be put to death. We're not going to have such a thing going on in Israel. And the man of God had enough courage and boldness to confront him. And said, David, you're the man. You're the one. What is your response when preaching confronts you? What's your response when preaching reveals your inadequacies? your sins, your shortcomings? Is it to excuse? Is it to hide? Is it to defend, to get angry? But this man who had done some terrible things, he got a revelation of himself through that simple little parable. And he began to weep and cry before the Lord. And in his period of repentance, and it perhaps lasted for days, but somewhere during that time, being a poet, he picked up his quill and he began to write these words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward heart parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom notice here what else he said purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice adversity hide thy face from my sin and blot out all mine iniquities create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. How many of you appreciate the Holy Ghost? Have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered what it would be like after having experienced the Holy Ghost for it to be utterly, totally taken from you and not be able to feel it? I've even had backsliders tell me I've been away from God for years and living terrible lives, but there would be times that of sanity, I guess you'd say moments of sanity, and they'd say, God, please, whatever you do, don't leave me. Keep dealing with me. I want to be saved. I don't want to be lost. And David's cry, David's prayer was, God created me a clean heart, renewing me a right spirit, 
Don't cast me away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. I'm preaching this afternoon to all of us that struggle with the weakness of our flesh. I'm preaching to every young person, every adult in this building that has desperately, desperately tried to overcome areas of weakness in your life. I'm talking about people that are so sincere that there's been times when you've gone on fast, maybe for a day or two or three or a week or maybe longer, and say, I'm going to fast until I overcome this, only for it to return and bother you again as strongly or more so afterwards than it did before you fasted. And you really, really would like for once and for all to get rid of it. I'm telling you, the key to overcoming sin is to get a revelation of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. If somehow in the next few minutes, God could give you a little insight, a little revelation into the exceeding sinfulness of sin, it will minimize your struggle so much. I'm not saying you'll never have a struggle again, but I'm telling you it's going to give you some strength and victory like you've never known before. I want every head bowed. I want all eyes closed. No one's looking around. I'm not looking around. I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm not asking you to do anything except close your eyes. And if you have areas in your life that's been a besetting sin to you, a recurring theme, it seems like the devil always knows how to set up the scenario to where you're confronted with this sin so conveniently again and again and again. And you're tired of the struggle. You're tired of dealing with it. And you want to overcome it and get it on the blood once and for all. I want you to do this right now. I want you to pray and I want you to say to God, God, let me see this sin in my life the way you see it. Or you might want to say it like this, God, give me a revelation of the exceeding sinfulness of the sin. Would you pray that prayer right now in honesty, in sincerity? God, I want to be clean. I want to be holy. I want to be righteous. I want to live a life that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And I want a revelation of your holiness. And I want a revelation of the ugliness of sin. I want it. I want it. I want it. If rock music is something that keeps pulling you back, you need a revelation of the debauchery. Not only of the music, but of the system that drives it. Country music keeps pulling you back into its clutches. You need a revelation of the filthiness of that lifestyle that is glorified and glamorized by that type of music. If Hollywood is pulling on you, and again and again you struggle with it, you need a revelation of how filthy and vile that entertainment system is and how it was devised by hell itself to lead men and women to destruction. Immorality is pulling on you. You're struggling. You're struggling. You need a revelation. I hope this is all right, what I've preached today. I had to obey God. This is what I felt in the Holy Ghost. I want to see you liberated. I want to see you set free. I want to see you filled with victory. And I'm offering you an opportunity. I'm offering you an opportunity right now, if you want to pray, to come forward. Find a place to talk to God. 
And you know what? It wouldn't hurt any of us to get a new revelation of God's holiness and righteousness and a revelation of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Can we find a place to pray? I know it's late. I know you're tired. But we need to pray. We need to seek the Lord. And I'm telling you, you can get some victory before you leave here this afternoon. You can get some victory before you walk out of here. I'd like to hear some old time wailing, weeping, crying, crying out to God. Come on, can we pray? Before you leave, would you just take at least a minute and pray? If you don't feel that you need this for yourself, would you pray for the benefit of those that so desperately needs a touch of God in their life today? Come on, let's seek the face of God. Oh, let's come and call on the Lord. Let's dig deep within our bosom, in our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirit. Let's repent and begin anew.